Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's a start. That's Balinese Gamelan, but played by a London group. And my point here is, is essentially that 20 years ago, we had lots of music groups, traditional music groups, coming from around the world to Britain or moving around the world to other places to perform for us. And that was a very valuable part of cultural diplomacy. Something's happened since then. And it's happened that we have a lot of British people involved here, or fusions, rather than the cultural diplomacy of traditions moving around the world. So something's changed. When our recent forebears founded the United Nations, there was a sense that by understanding each other, the world might henceforth avoid a conflict that would consume us all. Academics sought out difference. So it was with those who created the foundations of ethnomusicology, the discipline that I work in, music outside the Western art canon, who in former years had compared disparate sound worlds and delineated their differences. They did it from home, from their offices and studios, and the post-World War II years marked, marked rapid increases in accessibility as the age of cheap jet travel dawned. There was, though, always something romantic in concepts of difference. Here's, can I have the next slide, please? Here's um, Cecil Bowerer describing heroic poetry in 1952, somewhere between earlier colonial-era colonial anthropology and the new approach. In certain parts of the world, there is still a flourishing of telling tales in verse. This art embodies a more primitive outlook which admires any attempt to pass beyond man's proper state of magical, non-human means. It presupposes a view of the world in which man is not the center of creation, and his special interest lies in his supposed ability to do what cannot be done by the exercise of specifically human gifts. And I can see we've got a slight problem with the, the um, slides. I quoted this in a book that I recently co-wrote on the Kyrgyz epic, The Manas. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Again, consider Alan Lomax, um, to whom we owe much of the rediscovery of Gallic Psalmody and many of America's homestun musical forms, not least the blues. Um, and he argued that the world is an agreeable and stimulating habitat precisely because of cultural diversity. Next slide. From here, let me cast forward to today's globe-touring tourists, who McConnell's Anthropology of Tourism reminds us search out the wholeness of difference, looking for experiences but wary of the inauthenticity they find in airport art, that's a quote, available from souvenir shops, combating what they feel they have lost as a result of globalization and fragmentation. The tourist gaze, John Uri tells us, is attracted to the other, provided, of course, there's a four-star hotel and McDonald's somewhere close by to escape to. And indeed, last week I was in Kazakhstan traveling with some American um, ethnomusicologists who got very annoyed that the motorway rest stations were basically basic brick buildings with holes in the ground for toilets and no doors. There was no way they were going near those. They wanted more. Anyway, it's home. We've embraced comfortable levels of difference. Guillermo Gomez Pena's light difference is useful here. We encounter it in our eat attainments of, of themed restaurants and the shop attainments of our out of town mells. And this, it seems to me, marks out our concept of world music, a genre that since 1990 has had a billboard chart and which since then has replaced folk music with a dedicated Grammy Award. Difference in world music means Africans playing African music as cultural ringers, or does it? Next slide, please. Lila Cheetah, the London-based Balinese gamelan group heard just now, is clearly Indonesian light in terms of, ethnic of ethnicity, and it won't win any prizes in Bali, even if we use it over here. Next slide, please. A second British-based musician I've recorded and worked with, the Zimbabwean Chartwell Dutero, actually struggles to get gigs with his band because it includes white Europeans alongside Africans. And in Zimbabwe, Chartwell replaced guitar riffs with Shono Mbira during an eight-year stint with Thomas Matfumo and the Black Sun Limited. But he's lived in Britain since 1994. Next slide, please. I'll read this. What I've achieved might be considered threatening by traditionalists, but Western musicians I've worked with have mastered the music better than many Zimbabweans. If the guitar has a place in African music, why can't a Westerner master the Mbira? Sponsors disagree with me. I was invited to play a concert in Bologna. We agreed fees and terms. When they got the list of band members, they cancelled the concert, saying they only wanted to book Africans to play African music. Now, being a cultural ringer, if we have really embraced cultural difference, shouldn't be important. 
Surely this is the message of Arjun Abadurai's much-cited notion of de-territorialization, of the breaking down of boundaries as capitalism consumes difference. It is surely the message of Frederick Jameson's sense of cognitive capitalism, in which difference is fragmented in a way that allows us to consume sensorially rather than having to fit within a sense of collective identity. We're back to eat attainments, shop attainments, the Balinese restaurant or the Thai restaurant you go to in London, which is somewhere between Bali and here. Wagamama would be a wonderful example of that. This is not to deny the politics of power, in which, say, the great Malian Ngoni lute player, next slide, please, um, Basaku Koyate, walked off stage in London a few years back during Africa Express, because Damon Albarn, formerly of Blur, was too bossy. Or in which, next slide, please, the Senegalese Yusun Dor was reduced to backing Dido in the rendition of his song, Seven Seconds, during Live 8, having some years earlier walked out of his recording contract with Virgin, complaining that the company didn't want to record contemporary Africa. They wanted an Africa that was different, unsullied by the realities of global exchange. Now, our awareness of the equality of man, which is what we strive for in cultural diplomacy, ought to be to break down such power relations. But this is the opposite of what's happened in the commodification of world music as a genre. It's a Western genre in which consumers demand difference on their terms. Next slide, please. The South African Mbukwanga group, Malatani and the Mahotela Queens, shifted from the standard disco costumes they wore for the African market, next slide, please, to traditional Zulu dress for the world music market. Or consider the largest selling world music album ever. Next slide, please. Graceland, where Paul Simon, working with African and Latin musicians, retains all copyright, not the Africans. Is this appropriation? Next slide, please. Well, ethnomusicologists have been critical. Louise Menchez described Simon as a musical colonizer, exploiting collaborative material for his personal gain. Charles Hamm critiqued him for utilizing sounds from elsewhere, appropriating them for us. And Steve Feld argued that Graceland was an imperialist foray into the undiscovered sounds of an undeveloped world, played out on a world music stage under the false claim of being democratic. Now, a few years after Graceland came out, Simon was touring with it. And if we have the next slide, and you need to push the pointer down here somewhere, and we should get some sound. This is Paul Simon touring, and the African musicians have disappeared. It's his band. We still think of it as African in some way. Very well known, yes? Think they're a sort of Ladysmith Black Bambazo, something like that? I'm going to go to the transition here, which is very typical of Quechua and, and South African popular music. And we're in South Africa. Thank you. Next slide. Just down, just click down, thanks. The next slide, thanks. And yet Graceland has sold millions. Any notion that the market can't be wrong needs to be resisted when it maintains such exploitative power relations. And the logic of world music has become one of a fusion of others, otherness and familiarity, cast in the terms, if you like, of Edward Said's Orientalism. Alvis impersonators dance and festival cultures celebrate, say, ritual music. I'm talking about WOMAD and things like that. Music that should invoke the ancestors, but is now performed on heavily mic'd stages. Mixes and fusions proliferate, as one anonymous online discussant criticizing a talk I gave on world music a few years back had it. 
I wouldn't exactly call it artistic endeavour when musicians from Papua New Guinea jam with the Scottish Banchery Strath Strathspey and Real Society or a welter Brit popsters sing along a Buena Vista. The resulting sounds are about as natural as Dolly Parton. Now, this is far from cultural diplomacy, and it seems necessary to balance the power relations inherent in our concepts of difference with re-territorialization, a term I'm borrowing from John Tomlinson, a reality that's increasingly seen as concomitant to de-territorialization, um, the globalization. And at this point, let me turn the tables. If we're worried about that, what happens if we go to another culture to consider world music? Next slide, please. And if you could um, write up the top right, you can hardly see it. Top right. Right, right. There is, yes. We're moving to Korea. So transporting the world music model there might involve playing the Beatles on Korean zithers. And the next slide, please. And again, if we can just hear this. Or well, for those of you who come from Russia, an old Russian song. Okay, next slide, please. Now, if an audience in London finds these somewhat strange, and they do, as somehow harmonically or melodically challenging or perhaps inappropriate, then this illustrates my difficulty with much commodified world music. Celebrated world music is not necessarily the music popular amongst the cultural group from which it ostensibly emanates. Here's an example of that, Buena Vista Social Club, um, up there with Graceland in the charts, and it returned to music in Cuba identified with the 1950s or before, not the Cuban music popular among the island youth in the late 1990s when it was recorded. But it quickly came to, to represent the sound of Cuba, so much so that if you visit the island now and for the last 15 years, every hotel will be playing Buena Vista Social Club. And the Cubans are saying this is music that symbolizes American rest and relaxation on our island, prostitution, gambling, and things like that, before Castro came to power. Um, Actually, with this, Cuban tastes had been subjugated to foreign tastes, all to generate tourist dollars. Wim Wenders and Ray Kuda, like Paul Simon, keep the copyrights and thereby claim ownership. The only good side about that is the two Korean tracks I've played are both marked traditional, which neatly does much the same. It avoids paying the originators of the music um, any money um, and claims that these are public domain. Let it be, things like that, never mind. Next slide, please. The evidence suggests deterritorialization works for some, but not for others. We're far from the world of understanding and equality that we claim to want. And actually, when I began my training as an anthropologist and ethnomusicologist, I had first to discover methodology. I read a book, an anachronistic book by Hortense Powdermaker, wonderful name, Stranger and Friends, and sampled Malinowski's publications. I learned one must never go native, even though data was to be collected by observing others. Theory should emerge from reworking the data as ethnography, and language was best learnt as one went along, not something to be mastered through serious studies. Now today, we would, I hope, recognise the need to base our ethnographies on a greater intimacy, on deeper understandings, and to build in feedback loops that treat those we study um, as experts on their own life and culture, which would mean the African musicians of Graceland or the Cuban musicians of Buena Vista as the experts in their culture. Not Wim Wenders, not Paul Simon. Let me just consider ethnomusicology. In the 1950s, after World War II, learning to perform began to be used as a method to access data to enrich our understandings. And two of our leading ethnomusicologists, Mantlehood in the States and John Blacking here in Britain, believed that this was where things stopped. Since one should never go native, ethnomusicology couldn't be about becoming a proficient performer. But by the 1980s, ethnomusicologists were beginning to go further, to become professional sitar or tabla players. And this was encouraged as university music programs built performance into degree courses. Much as the university had choirs and orchestras, so the newly installed ethnomusicologist was meant to bring a way to teach and perform Indonesian gamelan, Cuban big band, or Middle Eastern ensemble. You saw it in the first slide, of course. 
In such ways, academia tried to embrace multiculturalism. And yet, still today, few ethnomusicologists or anthropologists are cultural ringers. By and large, we, for I am one of them, interpret otherness. In reality, we're forced to reject the need for cultural ringers, for African music to be taught by Africans, Korean music by Koreans. If our academic disciplines, if we ourselves and our jobs and our ability to recruit students from and in the West are to survive. And so we become Janus faced because we argue for authentic experiences and for everybody to appreciate the reality of cultural difference. We represent and interpret difference. So we advise people to avoid the souvenir sh shops on their travels and to seek out craftsmen who continue to create material culture in the way they've done so for centuries. We criticize the music and dance shows and packaged entertainment banquets. And we advise people to seek out local unpolluted musicians and dancers while joining the locals where they eat. Next slide, please. Now for me, and it's slightly ironic, I suppose, being in this building with the connection to Korea, hope for a resolution has come from an unexpected source. So with my Korean hat on, I struggled with, wait for it, Kangnam style. A podgy 30-year-old something star, Sai, singing and dancing his way through a song about failure in a language nobody understood. Very different from today's mainstream K-pop, and yet it's broken the counter on YouTube several times as it has exceeded 2 billion views. Next slide. A cultural meme, perhaps, but the thousands and thousands of parodies all share one thing. Rather than the failure of the original, they celebrate life as selfies, if you like, of personal or group identity. The Korean of the original song is forgotten. Next slide, please. And in fact, success abroad meant the song was used back at home to celebrate the inauguration of Park Geun-hye, the current South Korean president, where the lyrics, oh sexy lady, which should have been in your face, were simply overlooked. In a remarkable and unexpected way, common theories about the success of the Asian minority, about Orientalism and otherness, were, with Kangnam style, totally sidelined. And to all those who contribute a parody, the cultural ringer suddenly becomes us. Cultural difference melts away. And I'm going to close with one of the Kangnam style parodies, London style, since we're in London. If we can have the next slide, please. Which, apart from anything else, has some of my students in it and learns lessons from the original while contextualizing the unfamiliar with the familiar. Now, this raises huge questions about meaning and representation, but it actually renders those questions meaningless because we all become cultural ringers there should be a down on the bottom right if you put the pointer down there yep <laughs> just enjoy for a bit For those of you who are from abroad, this is some Pancras station just up the road.
Okay, if we just take the volume down. That's fine. Okay, suddenly we're running out of time, so I can't let you see all of that. There's lots of things I could say about that, obviously, but we're all cultural ringers in a way, and cultural difference seems to be more or less evaporating. But this leaves me with a problem. And the problem is, if I'm not careful, I will write myself out of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think music is, is a wonderful form of cultural diplomacy. If we have Korean musicians here, we're showing difference. And that's the way it was. If we have other people from around the world, it's difference. It doesn't involve language, so it doesn't necessarily get involved in politics, or it doesn't necessarily have language. Um, it's a very useful way of cultural exchange and for showing the difference of cultures around the world. Um, now, that's very valuable. Now, compared to that, if you look at something like Africa Express or Live 8, some of you will remember Live 8, I think it was 2007, um, the concerts in Hyde Park, the concerts in Paris, there were very, very few black Africans. They were all white, middle-aged pop stars. Yusun Dor, who I had a photograph there, was singing with Dido, it was his song, but he was sidelined, and Dido, the British Welsh pop star wasn't really trying. That's not cultural diplomacy. Um, at the last minute, because there were quite a lot of complaints from me and from many other people, um, Peter Gabriel, the founder of WOMAD, was asked to do something at the Eden Project down in Cornwall. And the local African musicians were all taken down there to perform. It was a sort of off-site Live 8, which made it onto your television screens every so often. But what use is it for us to think of Africa as a poor place needing aid and not to listen to its musicians? That's the point I'm making, really. Indeed, and, and the focus on the three R's in British schools is abysmal for many of us who work in the arts. Creativity is something that we, we strive after. And if you think of a knowledge economy, an IT economy, you're looking for people who are creative, not people who can just read and write or can add up sums. You want people to do something more than that. And I think the arts generally does allow people to create, to develop that part of their personality. Now, clearly we know that music also has other beneficial effects. It has effects in terms of allowing concentration, in terms of um, developing the brain and the reaction times and things like that. There's plenty of evidence out there to suggest it. It also has advantages of community. You create together rather than on your own. Now, I know that many of us have learned, up, learned the piano or things like that, which we do to, on our own, but orchestras, choirs, and actually creativity in school classrooms within the British GCSE system, for instance, is all about doing things together. So all of these things have to be good. And if we get rid of the arts and music, then the next generation of our children may be good mathematicians, may be able to read and write, but they're not going to be creative. They're not going to have that advantage in the world economy. That's right. That's right. And, and I do teach about music therapy, incidentally. <laughs> um, but there is one problem with music therapy, and that is that in this country, in America, it's developed, particularly since World War II, very much in a Western frame. Um, and five of the six um, major colleges where you can go and study music therapy in this, this country still insist on you having grade eight piano. Now, we're supposed to be multicultural and working with client groups in therapy who come from different cultural backgrounds. We shouldn't need to bring them into the music of our tradition. Um, and this is something that music therapy needs to sort out quite quickly. Um, and actually, it's, it's preventing some of my students going into music therapy. Um, they have to go away and get the skills on Western instruments before they're taken seriously. So, so I'm very supportive, but there are some issues. I was just thinking about the principles yeah. that what we use in music therapy. We work as a whole and intercommunication, and I think that's what this whole... And music therapy has a lot to do with improvisation and joining together. To yeah. Perhaps well, we're moving in the wrong direction in education. And the, the, global, the global idea of science and technology 
is probably the wrong idea. If you, if you look at um, major scientists, you'll find a lot of them are musicians. Um, so music doesn't detract from learning other things. It takes away some of the time, but perhaps it makes you concentrate better. If it develops your brain, it enables you to do other things. To come back to the, the music therapy, um, some of you will know the film Awakenings and um, the book, um, which is a wonderful example of how music can bring people out of states. Now, as we've got an aging population, again, music and other arts is very important there. And to, to use music that's appropriate to the people we're working with there. And next, please. Yes, I agree. Um, I can't put it up, but if you, if you go and look for the Chagossian drummers, the Chagos Islanders, um, you probably know were from what's become Diego Garcia, and lots of them live around Crawley. There is a community choir down there, the Ifield Community Choir, um, run by somebody who's doing a PhD with me. So the Chagossians, they were thrown to, taken to Mauritius first and left there because they're Creole speakers. Um, then in 2003, some of them challenged whether they were actually British or not, landed in, in Gatwick and basically settled there. And in the schools, they were treated as pariahs, as useless. They were living in the poorest part of town, close to drugs and things like that. They were sort of outcast, and they didn't do the, the three R's. They didn't do the reading and writing very well because they were French Creole speakers. Um, suddenly, my, my student, Patrick is his name, discovered that they knew music. They were drummers, and they knew songs with it. And he discovered, because they went away in one of the music classes and started creating, composing, as part of the project. The rest of the kids thought this was wonderful. And he was able to integrate these kids into the choir and other things as drummers. It's been very successful. It's been on at the proms. It's been on, on BBC several times. It's been showcased in a number of places. So just look them up, Chagossian drummers. The point about that is that very few of them are going on to study music at university. But from a, a position of being failures, there are now people going as far as Oxford to study other subjects. So these people who really didn't know much English and were considered useless, through being discovered, if you like, as having musical ability and that musical ability being showcased, they've achieved educationally to get onto universities.